Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Social Work Bubble podcast. I'm your host, Laura, a licensed master social worker, and I currently practice as a therapist in New York City. We have a special guest joining us today, Gloria Giso, a current social work student. Um, We'll be talking all about Gloria's social work journey, um, her experience as a student so far, um, and of getting a fresh perspective on the social work field. So thank you so much, Gloria, for being on the podcast today. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Um, Do you want to get started and just introduce yourself a little bit to the listeners? Sure. So I'm currently, um, I'm a social work student. I'm in my MSW program, and I go to Arizona State University. Um, and I'm in my first year of the program and in my second semester right now. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's going really good. Um, and my interest is with doing therapy and counseling. That's kind of where I'm leaning towards. But I also have an interest in macro social work as well. Um, My undergrad degree was community advocacy and social policy at ASU. So I kind of have a little bit background and definitely an interest in macro social work, but I've always um, been interested in eventually kind of doing therapy and counseling as well. Mm -hmm. So um, it's just been a really good experience with the program so far. And um, yeah. How exciting. I love the undergrad degree that you have. Like I've never heard Mm -hmm. of something like that. So that's really interesting. Yeah, um, I believe it's a newer program at ASU, Mm -hmm. like maybe just a few years old, and it's not a very common one. Um, And it's pretty similar to social work, but it's Mm -hmm. just a little more on the macro side. You get exposure to social issues, a little bit of political science and things like that. So, yeah. Certainly a good foundation for an Mm -hmm. MSW program. Wonderful. What made you decide to then choose an MSW pathway? So I think once I graduated, that was in December 2020, Mm -hmm. uh, was when I finished my undergrad degree. And at that time, I was kind of thinking about going to graduate school. Um, I wasn't really sure if I should work or go back to school Mm -hmm. at that time. So I did work very briefly And then I decided to apply for grad school. And I was kind of looking at different programs like community resources and development. Mm -hmm. Um, I was thinking about maybe doing a master's in counseling or psychology or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then I was also looking at the um, MSW program as well. So just trying to decide between those different options. They're all kind of in the same field and very related to each other, but um, I wasn't sure which one exactly to go with. Mm -hmm. So I I have always had an interest in doing therapy and counseling, but I think at the time that I finished high school and had to choose a major, Mm -hmm. um, I, at the time I was more sort of in a different headspace, I think, and Mm -hmm. more thinking about social issues and how do social issues impact a person on an individual level and then also on a community level yeah, and definitely. just in society. Um, and I, I think I was also thinking at the time, like it's hard, it's hard to imagine being a therapist, even having your own struggles. You think like, mm-hmm. how can I really help someone else? And it seems like very emotionally mm. heavy and kind of difficult, but then I still wanted to kind of go back to that um, Mm -hmm. when I was looking into graduate school. Certainly. What were the most distinguishing factors for you that kind of had you go with social work versus like a counseling degree or psychology degree? I think the reason why I wanted to go with the social work program was because um, with counseling or with psychology, it's a bit more narrow Mm -hmm. and that's kind of what I hear from other people as well like they choose social work because it gives you more options it's a bit more broad and it doesn't have as much of a focus on just the micro level or or mental health kind of in a vacuum Mm -hmm. like it's it really takes a look at how social issues or just your environment really Mm -hmm. impacts you on an individual level Mm -hmm. um And I think 
also when I was looking at the social work prog program and, and trying to work on applications, I was a bit overwhelmed, like, and I was nervous, like, am I going to get accepted or mm -hmm. the social work program requires volunteer experience. And I was wondering if my volunteer experience was actually valid for the application and things like that. Mm -hmm. But thankfully everything went well. So I was really happy to be accepted into it. Wonderful. What was some of that experience that you felt really helped you get admitted into an MSW program? Um, I don't remember exactly what experiences I put on that application, but I think I've had some different volunteer experience with a few places over mm -hmm. the past few years, kind of through high school and then through college as well. Mm -hmm. um, I did some volunteering in high school with um, an individual, I believe with Alzheimer's and dementia. Okay. And so we would like go through a workbook um, mm -hmm. and try to improve cognitive skills. And then in college, I did some volunteering at um, a transitional housing donation mm -hmm. center and um, I think a, a few other places. So mm -hmm. just I've had a little bit of exposure um, to social services and mm -hmm. how they work. And that's really been my area of interest. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that's huge, too. And. I do think it's an important part of like an MSW program if you are able to volunteer and get that experience because it can really show first what's out there, like what potentially you, your job could be after graduation, but also really get familiar with, am I even cut out to be doing this work? And is it a field I can really see myself in? Right. Mm. I think that's the nice part about having a field placement during the social work program too. Yeah even though it might be stressful at times trying to balance that with your classes, it is really important. And I feel like that's really where a lot of the learning takes place is when you're actually working with people mm -hmm. and you have to know how to act in these situations versus when you're in class, you're just more learning about theories about like hypothetical situations. So mm -hmm. definitely having experience is very valuable. Yes. It's very different than, I mean, real life situations, you mm -hmm. know, I remember when I was in grad school and, you know, I was, I went like a more clinical route. So you learn about diagnoses and how all these symptoms show up, but then when you actually have a client sitting in front of you describing their experience, it's not like they know the DSM criteria. And so mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting to actually see how these symptoms present in real life versus how they're written about by professionals in a book mm -hmm. um, and potentially a, a space of disconnect between people that are in charge of making a diagnosis um, and the criteria that come with that versus someone's experience. So mm -hmm. love the internships. That's great. Mm -hmm. What are you currently doing for practice for your field practice? So my current internship is as a patient advocate right. so we um help patients with their like if they're experiencing barriers to care mm -hmm. um and it's really it really centers around case management for the most part so a mm -hmm. lot of people deal with financial issues or sometimes transportation not being able to make it to their appointments and things like that so mm -hmm. it's really a good foundation I think for social work, um, especially considering that I haven't had too much experience in the field yet. So it's mm -hmm. been a good opportunity for me to gain skills like interviewing and mm -hmm. how to just meet with a person one on one and interact with them and sort of deal with people who are struggling and like how mm -hmm. how to comfort them and then manage your time effectively and, and mm -hmm. all those types of things. Yeah. Good practical skills. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Has there been anything else in your education so far where it's really resonated for you? You've seen, okay, wow, I know this is going to be helpful for me when I'm doing the work. Mm -hmm. So, so far in this first year of the program, it's been kind of a blend of learning about macro social work mm -hmm. issues or, or theories as well. Mm -hmm. And then in our, um, I think the class is foundation practice mm -hmm. yeah, or direct practice, but that class we've had each semester so far. And 
that's kind of where we learn a lot more about therapeutic interventions, like Mm -hmm. what is CBT or DBT, Mm -hmm. narrative therapy. Um, Those are some of the recent ones that we've learned about. And it's really nice to learn more about those um, and how they can be used. And I think it's nice that we learn about those therapeutic interventions alongside the macro social work theories. And um, it's just a really nice blend of everything. Um, and I think in the next year of the program, it'll be become more specific mm-hmm. and we'll kind of narrow it down to more concrete skills and how to, depending on the concentration that you choose, mm-hmm. how to um, really narrow it down and learn more kind of like everyday skills that you need Mm -hmm. as a social worker. Yeah, certainly. For your program, are you able to have a say in where you're placed or like what kind of internship you want to do? Mm -hmm. So the way it works is we have a website and all the internships or field placements are listed on there. So you can go on there and see all these different places um, Mm -hmm. and kind of look up like the city and see where, which location you kind of prefer. Um, And then they have a little bit of information usually under each one that's provided by that place Mm -hmm. and their contact information. So the student is pretty much responsible for finding their placement. Um, And so for my first year one, I, just kind of looked through um, I wanted to find something that was suitable for me and also not too far away mm-hmm. ideally from my house um, so I just reached out through email to a few places and then that's basically how it went and then I kind of followed up and then eventually like stuck uh, landed with one um, and then I'm kind of in the same process right now I'm looking into potential field placements for my next and last year of the program Mm -hmm. so I know I've heard that some other universities have it a bit differently where they get placed somewhere Mm -hmm. I think and it's it's not like their choice so um I think that's interesting too because then you get exposure in an area that you may not necessarily be interested in or you Mm -hmm. might not think it's interesting but then you do get experience and then you might change your mind. So mm-hmm. it's, it's interesting to compare, but yeah, um, yeah. We, we do get to choose at my school. Oh, great. Great. I remember, I think when I was an undergrad and I was doing my um, field placement for that because I got my bachelor's in social work. So I only mm-hmm. had to do one year for grad school. Mm-hmm. Um, but in that first field placement, you, for me, you just like put a list of like, yeah, these are the places I really want to be at and like mm-hmm. rank them in terms of what you really, really wanted. Mm-hmm. Um, but then when I got to grad school, I had a field advisor who would like, they, she called me and she was just like, you know, what kind of space are you interested in? I told her I was interested in therapy and I was on a more clinical path anyways. So she kind of reached out to a lot of the organizations. And then as she found one that would be doing an interview, um, she would call me and be like, are you good for this? And I'm like, sure, let's give it a go. Mm-hmm. So it was really interesting. I felt, I think maybe I would have preferred to be more hands-on, but it worked out and I got that experience. So mm-hmm. 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 good. All right. Um, what would you change about social work education or the MSW program that you've noticed so far? Um, I would say maybe it's been nice that in the first year we learned about a lot of foundational things, but I think maybe a piece that's missing is just learning about the more practical side of things. Like Mm -hmm. what does it mean to be graduated with an MSW? What is, what does it mean to be an LMSW or an Mm -hmm. LCSW? So far, I'm pretty sure we haven't really covered that. I've just heard about those things from other sources or Mm -hmm. just in conversation or even sometimes online, Um, but we haven't really learned about those things in class. Mm. So I think that's something I would include more of is um, what can you do 
with your degree? What are the different titles? How, what is the process of getting your license? Um, maybe even how much do you get paid in this job versus this job? Just the more practical side of things mm -hmm. um, versus the more textbook kind of information, which is important too, but yeah. yeah. Oh, it's very true. It's, it's certainly an area that's lacking. And I know one of the more difficult things, especially in the U.S. with social work, is it's different based on any single state that you're in, yeah. <laughs> which is so annoying. Um, yeah, like if yeah. you move, you have to retake the licensing exam, even though it's a national exam. The Association of Social Work boards aswb does the exam nationally so you're just taking the same exam but mm -hmm. if you move to a different state you have to do it over again and then the licensing requirements are different like in new york state um, after you get your master's degree um, it shows that you know you went to grad school you got your hours of practice and then you passed the exam then you can be a licensed master social worker mm -hmm. after three thousand hours of clinical practice which is about three years um, and then showing that you have the supervision hours, you take another exam and you can get your clinical license. And that means you can basically, you can have your own private practice. You get some like insurance benefits there. But I know like in New Jersey, right next to me in New York, it's, there's not even a thing of a licensed master social worker. It goes right to licensed social worker. And mm -hmm. it's just very strange because it makes it hard for people to even have any clarity, especially if you go to grad school, maybe out of state, or you're thinking about moving after graduation. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of information there. Mm -hmm. Which I know that some students in the program aren't mm -hmm. from Arizona, so they might be moving to a different state after graduation so it would mm -hmm. be even more useful for them to know that kind of information mm -hmm. and I I've seen um like you said different different acronyms like licensed master social worker LMSW mm -hmm. or the licensed independent clinical social worker and different things so yeah. it would be really great if they were all just standardized but make a lot more sense because mm -hmm. it's hard to tell what the equivalents are like mm -hmm. okay, I know I'm an LMSW but what does that even mean in another in another state and how do I know it's just it's it's difficult to communicate where yeah. you're at <laughs> so yeah definitely yeah um is that something you're thinking about I mean I'm assuming since you're interested in being a therapist and counseling that you're thinking about getting your license after graduation yeah um that's kind of my plan after graduation is to get my license, but I'm still sort of figuring out the difference between the LMSW and LCSW and sort of how to navigate that or what was sort of the benefits of going all the way to LCSW and, mm -hmm. and things like that. But I definitely would like to get my license um, just based on what I know. I think that it would be beneficial and mm -hmm. definitely useful. Certainly. And I know, too, I think as time goes on, a lot, depending on where you're located, a lot more employers are wanting a higher level of education and wanting licensure, which mm -hmm. makes it tough because a lot of the times that's not met with, you know, sufficient pay for being required to get a master's degree. Um, but yeah, I've noticed, especially in more metro areas. I mean, I'm originally from a very, very rural place in um, upstate New York. And a lot of the social service workers were just high school graduates or they didn't have a degree in human services or a related field. And mm -hmm. so it was kind of like they were desperate for workers. So you did like six weeks training and you're on the job, right? Mm -hmm. Where here in New York City, to be a child protection worker, which where I'm from, you'd take a training for six months and you'd be part of child protection. But here, a lot of them are required to be master's level social workers. So mm -hmm. it also just goes into where you want to live, you know, mm -hmm. like, and, and your long-term goals. So yeah. stuff. Mm. Okay. In terms of something I wanted to touch on, I was talking to someone about this the other day was the aspect of like cultural competence and diversity in our education. When I was an undergrad, there was not one single diversity or any kind of cultural competence class at all. What has your experience been for that? Um, I think 
we have touched on the differences between cultural competence and cultural humility mm-hmm. a few times in different classes, um, trying to think of which classes and in what ways, but we have learned about it um, and kind of discussed the differences between those two. So mm-hmm. what does it mean to be culturally competent? And then what does it mean to have cultural humility? So mm-hmm. from my understanding, it seems like they kind of have moved away from, um, at least in, in, from my classes and the way mm-hmm. that they've been teaching them, there's less of an emphasis on cultural competence and mm-hmm. more on cultural humility because mm-hmm. as they kind of explain, like you can't always be culturally competent and know everything mm-hmm. about someone's background. Yes. And sometimes people have a certain idea about a culture and so they will assume that a person has these certain characteristics that match up with their ethnicity, for example. And then it Mm -hmm. turns out that they don't align with those characteristics of the the culture Mm -hmm. of their ethnicity or something like that. Mm -hmm. So it's more of an emphasis on cultural humility and just being very flexible, not making assumptions Mm -hmm. um, and then providing what, what you can in terms of, Mm -hmm relevant services or relevant interventions and just kind of being as open-minded as possible Mm -hmm. I think there's more of an emphasis on that yeah um I know I think for one assignment or one class discussion we kind of looked at different cultural groups and a bit about their each one's history and um what's sort of appropriate and inappropriate with kind of Mm -hmm. each one but really it was just a little bit of that and Mm -hmm. I think the main focus is practice cultural humility and Mm. try to be culturally competent and learn as much as you can but you don't have to know everything about everyone Mm -hmm. because that's really kind of a very difficult Mm -hmm. goal to reach right certainly so it's a kind of allowing for the nuance of still Mm -hmm. you know understanding people as individuals Mm -hmm. um but I do think it's interesting how it's still not fully integrated into social work curriculum. Like it's more, it, to me at least, it seems like an add-on. Like, okay, don't forget about diversity. <laughs> you know, don't forget about culture. Instead of just integrating it into practice. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's that's a problem with social work <laughs> that is ongoing. Um, yeah, is that something that you've noticed in your field placement as well? Like an emphasis on any kind of diversity or inclusion? Um, maybe not a specific emphasis on that. Um, I think we definitely practice cultural right. humility. Um, but I I think it's hard in my head to, when I think about like diversity and inclusion to get away from thinking just about different Mm. ethnic cultures and think about what are all the different ways that people can be diverse. Mm -hmm. And there's definitely diversity in terms of age, um, life experience, Mm -hmm. um, maybe other kind of areas like that Mm -hmm. um previous life experiences Mm -hmm. um but I would say it's pretty good I I wouldn't identify any type of problem just in my personal experience I'm sure other students maybe have had some issues in in Mm -hmm. that area and as far as diversity inclusion or Mm -hmm. maybe working with people who are not very culturally competent and things like that but yeah good well that's great to hear I mean like we were talking about earlier a lot of the times education is very different than practically what our experience is like yeah and I think too that people always have bias it's Mm -hmm. hard to not have that but Mm -hmm. it's important to be very aware of it as well Mm -hmm. um and when you, when a person notices that they are feeling like biased about something, or they have a certain thought that they 
identify mm-hmm. it and then kind of see what's the source of that mm-hmm. feeling or thought. Um, so I've had those types of conversations with my field instructor before. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think in general, maybe the field placements from what I've heard from other students, sometimes field instructors don't have the time or capacity kind of just mm-hmm. based on their their workload or schedule or things mm-hmm. like that to be able to really slow down and have those conversations or mm-hmm. um, even talk about things like bias and mm-hmm. cultural competence. So it's definitely a struggle with um, finding the time and space for those things. Yeah. Certainly. That is very true. The essence of social work is having a lot to do and not having a lot of time for many other things. Yeah. Mm. Um, Switching gears a little bit, I want to talk about just feeling supported, right? So I'm assuming you have a supervisor at your internship, potentially like a faculty person or an advisor. Can you tell us about moments where you did feel supported? by those kind of leaders in your life or maybe moments when you could have used more support? Mm -hmm. Um, hmm. I think that people in the field or related to the program um, Mm -hmm. are usually open to giving support. It may be just more of from a student's perspective like Mm -hmm. not wanting to take up people's time or energy or things like that so I do feel like people are always willing to be there for you and listen to you for the most part Mm -hmm. Um, but it's more just that mentality of like I don't want to bother people with my problems or this is not a big deal like let me just move on Mm. and it's it's not it's not gonna really matter in the future so let me just like ignore this thing. But I think there is the, the support in place. Um, there's always at least one person that I feel like you could reach out to, um, especially in the program or other areas where social workers are involved. They're always trying to um, be open and available and mm-hmm. um, invite students to come and chat and things like that. And I know that there's the ASU counseling services for students um, and that's a free service. So there are resources. I think it might just be a matter of taking advantage of them Mm. and then um, being comfortable with being vulnerable and opening up. Yeah. Uh, that's a big thing. That's a, I remember that when I was a student was the vulnerability aspect, especially when mm-hmm. I was in supervision, um, a space where, you know, you can talk about what your struggles are. You can talk mm-hmm. about what's been great, but also what's been really tough. And for me, it just felt like, oh my gosh, I can't possibly say what was tough because then they'll think I'm a terrible social worker. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's a huge thing is learning to be vulnerable because not only will that help us grow as students and as social workers, as professionals, but also help our clients, the people that we're working with, because they're, they're not dumb. Like they can see when we're uncomfortable and maybe when we're not fully confident in what we're saying or feeling a little, you know, weird. Mm -hmm. And so being able to use that vulnerability to help us grow can also help you know, teach the people that we're serving, you know, this is the importance of vulnerability and how it can really, you know, change your life. Mm -hmm. I think it, especially with, um, if you're working as a therapist or you want Mm -hmm. to be a therapist, it's interesting how you kind of expect people to be open and honest with you and then be vulnerable Mm -hmm. and talk about maybe their mental health issues, but then Mm -hmm. you don't really want to do the same thing or tell anyone maybe at least in my experience like you don't really want to share those things with someone else so it's kind of um what's the word just like ironic like you Mm. don't want to be vulnerable but then you kind of expect other people so it's just good practice to try and do that I think Mm -hmm. as a student and then even continuing on in your career and in your life to 
practice being vulnerable so that you Mm -hmm. can see what it's like on the other side as well. And it's just good for your mental health too. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, especially when we talk about grad school and social work school, Mm -hmm. I mean, you're, you're training to be a professional that works with very vulnerable populations that works with very difficult things. And so I think showing vulnerability and being able to process things as they're happening will really set the foundation for being able to cope with the work and being able to take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm. Definitely. And even that reminds me, like Mm -hmm. we have the forms that we fill out every week for our internship Mm. um, where we just describe like what we did this week. And then we talk about supervision notes and things like that. And then there's the question that we have to answer every week about what did you do or maybe what are you planning to do this week for self-care like on a personal and professional level Mm -hmm. so I think sometimes I struggle with even finding something to put in there because I do different things but it's hard to find something um I feel the need to come up with something new every time for that but I think it would be fine to just say this is what I'm doing consistently to Mm -hmm practice self-care but sometimes I just can't even think of something like what did I do specifically as a form of self-care but Mm -hmm. then I just think about like even the most basic things they can be self-care like just Mm -hmm. spending some time watching tv or like unwinding those types of things Mm -hmm. absolutely just being able to pause for a moment and ask yourself you know what do I need right now (laughs) you know sometimes it's movement sometimes it's laying on the floor in darkness and just Mm -hmm. enjoying not being stimulated in any way, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, and so just, but giving ourselves the time to pause, which can be really hard, especially as a student. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think I know I've heard from other students and I feel this too, Mm -hmm. that when you have a lot on your plate or a lot of things to work on with assignments, and then we always have assigned readings that a lot of times we don't even get to, So it feels like when you do have a little bit of spare time, you want to take advantage of it and Mm -hmm. actually do something. But I'm trying to, or I think I've gotten better at like when I do have that time, I will sometimes decide to just watch a show instead of like working on something because there's always more work to do constantly. Mm -hmm. So if you are always chasing after your work, like you're really going to be exhausted and burnt out. Mm -hmm. So it's good to just refresh your mind and and really pay attention to the self-care which they do they do mention it a lot and I think there is a decent amount of emphasis Mm. on self-care good it's a it's a foundation you know for being able to do the work and Mm -hmm. you know it's also skills that again we we bring to the work that we do with our clients you know being able to teach our clients about self-care goes directly into what we know about it too yeah Mm. great yeah I like what you said about um lost my train of thought when we were talking about self-care oh like um feeling like we always have to just fill the time you know something that you know I learned to practice was just asking myself like how is this serving me right now or is there something that could be serving me better because I remember I mean being up at (laughs) I remember thinking to myself all right I'm gonna go to bed right now at three o'clock in the morning take a nap for two hours then I'll wake up at five and finish this paper and it's kind of like Laura how is this really serving you right now (laughs) like realistically or like when you have a lot of reading to do and it's super late and you know you're not really soaking any of the information up like asking yourself is this really serving me or is there a better use of my time like resting Mm -hmm. or drinking some water staying connected Mm -hmm. with friends and family so I don't feel so isolated you know Mm -hmm. really going into those things that help us feel grounded that give us the foundation to to thrive from definitely Mm -hmm. yeah yeah I know with the readings that's um definitely a struggle area because I think both semesters so far and I think other students have experienced this too where like you try to keep or stay on top of the readings sort of from the beginning of the semester Mm -hmm. which I've tried so far with the beginning of both semesters and trying to commit to actually doing the readings every week for each class but that's just been an area where yeah it's it's been hard Mm -hmm. while trying to stay on top of assignments and other things and 
than being at my field placement. So the readings are usually what get ignored first because mm-hmm. sometimes they're they're more like supplementary. Mm-hmm. So um, yeah, those kind of get pushed to the side, even though I feel like they are really valuable. And when I do them, then it helps me like understand the course content more, mm-hmm. but that's just something where it kind of gets pushed. But I hopefully with a little bit more free time during the summer, I'm kind of planning to like go back and read some of those. There we and, go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so. yeah. I remember that was always the first thing to go for me too, because it's, it just feels more passive, you mm-hmm. know, and when you have an upcoming paper or, you know, you have to go into your field placement, mm-hmm. it kind of seems like, okay, reading this is not so important, but you're right. Like they are certainly helpful. And when I did the reading assignments, I could, I knew like, okay, this is helpful information, but we also have to have realistic expectations for ourselves and Mm -hmm. trying to get all of the reading done, especially, I mean, social work is so reading and writing heavy. Mm -hmm. We have to know it's, it's really not possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. God. What would what's some advice that you would give to fellow social work students, whether they're at undergrad, grad school? What would you need to tell your younger self? Um, I would say, like, probably this would be advice that could apply to anyone. Mm-hmm. But I think especially because social work is kind of a broad field and there's a lot of different areas you could go in. Mm-hmm. to just try and get as much experience as possible in different areas. So get exposure to different topics, maybe um, look into direct practice, but then also look into macro practice and sort of spend a little bit of time in different areas and then kind of see where you naturally fit mm-hmm. um, so that you don't feel like you are only looking in one direction and that's where you end up, but instead just trying to see all the different options of what's out there Mm. and seeing kind of where you gravitate most. And I think I'm still even in the process of doing that Mm -hmm. um, in this first year of the program. Like, I feel like I have somewhat of a better idea of where I want to end up in the future, but it's still not 100% there. Like Mm -hmm. I, I need more experience still to know like this is exactly what I want to be doing Mm -hmm. and it could even change down down the line too like years later I I might say okay I want to go um more into macro social work now or I want Mm -hmm. to switch to something different so just trying to really um stay alert and seeing all the different options that you have Mm -hmm. I think is good yeah. to keep in mind certainly having that open mind is so important especially as a first year student I think many people maybe they didn't have a say in where they're being placed and so they're kind of like okay bummer I don't want to be here I know I'm not going to be working here in the future mm-hmm. um, but having that open mind because that in itself is a learning experience and mm-hmm. you're still able to transfer a lot of social work skills into that yeah. space even if it's not a place you'll be mm-hmm. staying at mm-hmm. because I think with the field placements a lot of skills are transferable. Mm -hmm. So you learn certain things at one that you could really apply anywhere, like especially interviewing or doing assessments, working one-on-one with people. Mm -hmm. If you learn it at one place, then you could transfer those skills to another. So those Mm -hmm. are really just like concrete, like foundational skills. So it's not like if you're at an internship, um, it's a waste of time. I think it's Mm -hmm. always valuable in some way. Yeah. Absolutely. And social work is one of those fields where, I mean, there's so much variety, there's so much flexibility in what you can do. And I mean, Mm -hmm. I didn't even know I was going to be a therapist until I was in grad school. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so I always wanted to do forensic social work, which Mm -hmm. I'm still interested in. And I know in the future that if I change my mind, I can do that. And ultimately a social work degree is a social work degree. And, you know, if you do change your mind, it gives you the flexibility to do that. Mm -hmm. So I kind of have a question about a forensic social work. Yeah. Um, I recently I was listening to a presentation about forensic social work and I kind of expected it to be about like forensics in terms of like people committing a crime or commit like murder, things like of that nature. But it was mm-hmm. more about the prison system and working with inmates and things like that. So I think I compare it to forensic psychology 
Yes. I don't know if it's the same, like if forensic social work is something different or something else. They're very similar. I feel like with forensic psychology, there's a lot more like assessment and diagnosis Mm -hmm. that happens there. Forensic social work, again, because of the essence of social work, it's more flexible. When I was an undergrad and I was at a child advocacy program, we worked with children and families that had experienced childhood sexual abuse and trafficking. And so the case managers there were forensic social workers um, because they basically helped with moving through the court system, you know, so like this is the paperwork you need to do, like um, navigating, working with victim services and the DA Um, at a child advocacy center. um, They work in a multidisciplinary team model. So law enforcement's present, the district attorney is present. um, Then it's, it's a whole it's a whole group of people that are there. And so the forensic mm-hmm. social workers also helping the family um, and potentially the foster family navigate all those people, um, introducing the child into, you know, if perchance the child has to testify, helping them practice, helping them get comfortable, and also keeping the other people <laughs> part of the team in line, you know, making sure the law enforcement officers are acting in a, an appropriate trauma-informed way. I know some people that do forensic social work for defense attorneys. So they work with, um, which are two very different sides of the coin, right? Like working with a district attorney versus the defense. Um, They focus a lot on doing, I can't remember what they're called. It's basically like a narrative of the defendant's life story and basically Mm -hmm. showing, given this person's maybe mental health history, um, biopsychosocial data, their own trauma, we can see why this crime took place. Mm-hmm. You know, so the social worker helps the client kind of form their defense, really, mm-hmm. and helps them write that whole spiel about kind mm-hmm. of their story. Um, and then, of course, we have working within the prison system, right? I know a lot of forensic social workers that work with people that are incarcerated. They do more treatment-based things. So they might run like a therapy group or do individual one-on-one therapy with someone. So it's more mental health treatment-based. There are assessments involved in there. Um, and I'm assuming, depending on the space that you're working in, there's going to be forensic Um, psychologists that are there as well. From Mm -hmm. what I've seen, I think a lot of forensic psychologists, they're the ones that are almost more legitimate (laughs) in terms of like having them being called to the stand to give an expert as an expert witness Mm -hmm. on on someone. So it's- Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. That clears it up more for me Mm -hmm. because I know I've heard a lot about forensic psychology in the past. And like you said, I think it's, that's more focusing on making a diagnosis and Mm -hmm. then telling the court like this is what I think this person is diagnosed with and then the Mm -hmm. social worker can be in different areas like legal assistance advocacy or Mm -hmm. um kind of case management like helping the family navigate the system Mm -hmm. so yeah yeah definitely those core tenants of like empathy and advocacy. I think Mm -hmm. we see, especially in forensic social work, like trying to get other people to understand our clients from an empathetic perspective and then be the ones to advocate for their needs. So it's an interesting field. I really like it. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, a lot of times um, people also don't expect that social workers are therapists too. Mm -hmm. I think I've heard that social workers are like the biggest portion of mental health providers in the country which is really interesting because I think for the longest time when I was younger I wanted to be a therapist so I thought like okay to do that I should Mm -hmm. become a clinical psychologist that's how I'm gonna get to that goal Mm -hmm. but then only in very recent years I was like figuring out that you can do therapy and counseling just as a social worker, like with your Mm -hmm. MSW. So that's um, something that I didn't really realize. And it's Mm -hmm. just surprising that actually so many social workers work in um, counseling. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, it's something that, I mean, 
I remember too, I was the same way. Like I didn't realize that was a thing and I didn't really consider being a therapist as an option until I knew that that was a possibility as a social worker. Mm -hmm. And even before I came to social work school, I started off as a nursing major because I had never really even heard the term social worker. Like I really had no idea what that meant, like what kind of job that would entail. And so that's, you can do a lot with it, which is great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's also the assumption with social work that most people will assume that you're working in child protective services. Yes. And I also had that idea in my head just because that that's a common like Mm -hmm. route that a lot of social workers take. um, And it's very popular in the media too. Mm -hmm. So that's another reason I think why I didn't choose social work earlier. Maybe if I had known that that information before that social workers can do therapy, they can do these other things. It's not just like child protective services then maybe Mm -hmm. I would have made some different decisions with my education Mm -hmm. but yeah it's just it's very interesting yeah absolutely you're right about how social workers are portrayed in the media I would just love I've always thought I would love to have like a social work show like they have so many law enforcement shows out there I'm like no we need one with a team of social workers like showing us how to support people I think that would be so cool Um, but that's just not seen in the media yeah Mm. yeah well it's certainly a great field with a lot of um, opportunity and flexibility Mm -hmm. Mm. wonderful all right well I think that wraps us up for today Gloria thank you so much for coming on the podcast it's been so great being able to chat with you to see where you're at in your journey and what brought you to social work um where can listeners continue to follow your journey um I'm thinking if I have anything to plug, probably just um, maybe my Instagram. Sure. Yeah. I don't know if there's anything else. I'm on LinkedIn too, if anyone okay. wants to just connect professionally. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's just my name. Um, but if you, yeah, if you search up my name online, you can find my LinkedIn. And I'm also on Instagram, Facebook as well. So wonderful thank you so much thank you everyone for listening to today's episode please feel free to leave your thoughts in the comments and don't forget to like and follow the social work bubble podcast on whatever platform you're listening on and we'll see you next time thank you so much